Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Into the Dark Room podcast. I'm Leona Hatch with my co-host, Riley Honey, and today we are here with Miss Sarah Bennett. Hi. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, welcome in. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you started pursuing photography? Um, yeah, I actually came to photography through advocacy. I'm a former lawyer, and I was trying to figure out how to um, get one of my clients out of prison. And so um, I don't know how detailed you want me to be about it, but she had a 75-year-to-life sentence, meaning she was going to spend her whole life in prison unless I could get her out of prison. Wow. And so I was trying to get clemency from the governor of the state of New York, which clemency is like an extraordinary remedy. And I was trying to figure out how to humanize her. And I was working on the case for a couple of years. And originally, um, we had a blind governor at the time. And so I got kind of famous actors to read from letters of support. So I was kind of thinking outside the box a little bit. And it just um, popped into my head one day. I don't know how. I'm, I wasn't a photographer. So um, it just popped into my head. Maybe I would take photos of some of the women who had been incarcerated with her and have them talk about her influence on, on them. And I put together a little advocacy pamphlet. It was photos with the writing, and I sent it to the governor and state legislators. And um, at that time, a newly created um, commission on reentry. And I got such an overwhelmingly interested response that that's how I started doing photography around women with life sentences. Wow. That's so inspiring. Thanks. <laughs> Was she on your website? Because I, I took a little glance at your website. Um, and what do you mean? In what, in what way? Because I think I remember seeing one of the women that you photographed had the 75. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's there. Okay. She's, I photographed her inside prison and mm -hmm. then actually one clemency for her. And I photographed her. She's also in my bedroom project, which is women who had life sentences and have come home. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. And congratulations to her. I hope she's able to listen in. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she will. You never know. I agree. I hope she's able to. Yeah. I think that would be fun. Yeah. Especially for her to hear like her lawyer. Yeah. yeah. I think she's heard me speak a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, where are you from originally? Um, I actually grew up in Toronto, Canada. Ooh. Wow. But I came to the States when I was around 18. I went to college in California. And then I moved to New York, and I've been there ever since. Is it true that Canadians are really kind? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Canadians like to think they're really kind. People in the States always say that, like, oh, my gosh, when you go to Canada, like, people are so sweet and kind, and they're so polite. And I think because people in the U.S. are just kind of in their own mark, and they're not too <laughs> fond of helping others out if they're not in the mood. I don't know. I think... I don't know. I think Americans would get a bad rap, honestly. You know? <laughs> I feel like you almost said Canada. <laughs> I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> They're from Canada. Yeah. But that's the reputation of Canadians. Yes. I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you said you were in California for a while for school. Where did you go? Uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz. Wow. Oh, wow. So what did you study? Law? Uh, no, I studied women's studies. Wow. Mm. I was actually one of the first women's studies majors in the country because wow. we're going back many decades. So. <laughs> well, it's an amazing accomplishment to have. And us women need all the help we can get. Yeah, exactly. So I am going to throw a surprise question at you. Okay. You went. You said women's studies. Mm -hmm. How did you go from women's studies to being a lawyer? Oh, I've had so many different steps along the way. So after college, I moved to New York and I worked for an alternative news service. And so I was like a journalist. And that's I learned um, offset printing and typesetting. I kept the books, and mostly I wrote a lot of articles. And then from there, I worked as a typesetter at the New York Review of Books, which I always consider as my education because it's a pretty lofty kind of journal. And then I went to law school. And um, I went to law school because I kept on applying for jobs, like I wanted to run like a small nonprofit or something, and the jobs kept on going to lawyers. And so I was like, oh, maybe I should become a lawyer, then I'll get the job. And so that's why I went to law school. And then I had a detour <laughs> doing criminal law for the next almost 20 years, which I actually really loved, but I also burned out at a certain point. So that's, so then I did, after I left the practice of law, 
this is nobody knows this because I haven't figured out how to fit it within my narrative, but I actually wrote a book called The Case Against Homework. Wow. And um, I was an anti-homework advocate for about eight years. I was trying to change policy around kids doing too much homework. But I always kept a legal case. And that's so that's how I ended up representing Judith Clark. And that's how I came to photography. But I never imagined, honestly, I never imagined that the photo project I did for her would turn me into photographer, which it actually did. So it's been exciting. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Yeah. It is. And I love the anti-homework. Yeah. <laughs> my, little, my little sister um, is in high school now, but when she was in middle school, she her school went on a track for a couple of years to veto homework. Mm -hmm. And they did things not as letter grades, but as participation mm -hmm. and ability to execute a, a skill. Mm -hmm. um, and it really benefited her. She's very specific in her learning strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. and it really helped her pass through well, the grades correctly. It's, well, I'll take a little credit for that because <laughs> my, book, my book came out in 2005, uh -huh. and yeah. that was the beginning of a new conversation around homework because people really weren't thinking about it. And that's kind of when homework became really intense mm -hmm. for little kids. And um, I always used to say, which is true, there's no correlation between homework and academic achievement. And so people are spending a lot of time on something that has no proven benefit. Mm -hmm. So, but if you want to know, like, how do you get, because sometimes people ask me, how do you get from kids to, to, uh, people who are imprisoned, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, that is quite the jump. <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually not when you think about it because there are two segments of society that have zero power and zero say over the way their life goes. That's very true. And that's, that's very true. so it's really, I think my whole life has kind of been fueled by passion for people who don't have, um, you know, any agency. Wow. Well. That's I so have nothing cool. to say to that. Like, no, it's, like, <laughs> it's not bad. Like that just resonates with me. Yeah, the strength that you have to go after it and us try to help those people mm -hmm. and those groups of people is so strong of you. Because I imagine there are so many people throughout your journey being so negative towards you, going towards that idea, trying to tell you like, why are you trying to help these people? But you're so strong to help them anyway. Well. You know, the conversation around incarceration has changed a lot, especially in the last five years. But when I started out as a defense attorney, there was a book that was called How Can You Defend Those People? And there was a point at which I never told people what I did because I got so tired of defending what it was that I was doing. Nowadays, everybody thinks that's kind of a sexy topic, <laughs> but it really wasn't for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. I was always like sort of fighting against um, what people think is right or wrong. I feel like this also goes to show like, you know how people are always saying like the world is only black and white, mm -hmm. like you can only see black, mm -hmm. see in black and white, like mm -hmm. the colors. I feel like this goes to show that there's gray areas too. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance. And the problem is we don't have those conversations around nuance mm -hmm. anymore. Because people think they're so scary. Right. I know. And yeah. I love to have conversation around nuance. Because it's so needed. Yeah, it is. It is very needed. So to pull it back to your law mm -hmm. portion of your life, where did you go to law school? Um, Rutgers in Newark, mm. New Jersey. Oh, cool. Yeah, so you're cool. Cl you're close to here still yeah. for law school. Wow. Kind of. Yeah. You were destined to come here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you were tiptoeing around yeah. Pennsylvania. Yeah, and exactly. We just sucked you in. So. <laughs> My husband's from Pennsylvania. Oh, See, wow. So you were already sucked in to begin yeah. with. He was just slowly sprinkling yeah. it in for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the scenes that you have the women sitting in on your website, mm -hmm. um, the ones where they're sitting like in prison, mm -hmm. are they in those scenes because you picked them or because the women picked them? And then what is the significance of those scenes? Okay. So t first of all, to get permission to photograph inside prison is really, really, really difficult. So that was a series, it's called Looking Inside Portraits of Women Serving Life Sentences. That's what I always wanted to do from the very beginning. But when I started out, I didn't have any credibility as a photographer and I 
couldn't even imagine asking for permission to go in. So after I had been doing the other work for maybe five or six years, I called the Department of Corrections and I said, I'm a photographer and I do this and can I theoretically photograph women with life sentences? And they were like, yes, theoretically you can. And I said, and where could I photograph them? And they said, you can photograph them in the conference room. And I said, that would be really boring. I have a bedroom project and I would like to photograph them in the cells. And they were like, you will never photograph in a cell. And I said, can I speak to your supervisor? And they're like, I am the supervisor. You will never photograph in a cell. And I said, is there somewhere else that I might be able to photograph? And they got back to me. We did a lot of negotiation. And eventually it said, they said I would be able to photograph in the women's workplaces, depending on what the workplaces were. So then I went about finding women to photograph. So first I wanted to have theoretical permission before I actually reached out to anybody because I didn't want to get anybody's hopes up, right? Mm -hmm. And so then I started to write to... I mean, my client, Judy, was still in prison. She introduced me to one person. That one person turned out to be phenomenal at helping me find other women. And I would go to the prison and I would meet them first without my camera. And we would just talk and I would tell them what I was doing. And then I would um, write to the Department of Corrections and I'd say, I would like to photograph so-and-so and she works in such and such a place. Can I do that? So that's how it was. So there was no choice on the part of the women no choice really on my part it was actually the department of corrections but i think they think of it as a workplace um series but i think of it as uh just this is women inside mm -hmm. and actually it turned out to be great it was much better than the cell because we actually get to see all around the prison and even though i'm not asking them what they're doing you get to see how prison runs no, I mean, taking a look at your website, I didn't realize there were so many rooms in uh -huh. a prison. Uh -huh. I... Well, the people in prison run the prison. They do the work. They do everything. They do the cooking. They do the electric, you know, they're electricians, they're plumbers, they're contract. I mean, they're painters, they're plasterers, they're, you know, they're peer counselors. They're, they do everything. Wow. So that's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. In the media, when they portray incarcerated individuals, they never portray them in that light. No. Which and I, is so, mm -hmm. like, demeaning for them. Mm -hmm. It makes the public see them as just an object and not as people. Right. And I think the way that you chose to highlight those people as human beings in the workplace in while they are incarcerated is Yeah, I think, it, I think it really worked. So I was... Yeah. And in all the years I was a lawyer... Um, like when you first come into a facility, there's always a lawyer's room and then there's a visiting room. And most people never, ever get beyond those spaces. I actually had been beyond that space a few times because one time they allowed me to give a workshop to the whole prison population. Wow. And so I was in the gym once and I was somewhere else once. But once I started photographing, I really got a sense of the prison. And I did get the cell, even though they told me <laughs> I would never, ever, ever get the cell. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Heck yeah! But, and it's, it's not on my website because I don't think I was supposed to get the cell. You probably get in some trouble. <laughs> uh, no, it's probably not me who would get into trouble. Oh. It was it would be somebody in the Department of Corrections who would have gotten into trouble. So, but most of them are gone by now because oh. that was five years ago. Mm. But I will show that photo later today. I'm oh, sure. I'm excited <laughs> to see. <laughs> I was really excited to get into a cell and see what it looks like. Yeah. It looks bad. Oh, I definitely have a picture in my mind of what I imagine a cell to be from like television shows mm -hmm. and all sorts of different media of what they push into our minds of what's in the cell in a prison. But well, there's I can't really, even imagine they're what they're really the reality small. Is. Like if you stretch out your arms, like it's not that much wider than this booth that we're in. It's a little bit longer. And don't forget, there's like a little toilet in there and there's a sink. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that you don't really know until you go in one is how confined it is because there's like if there this one had a little bit of window, but there's just like little slats to the outside. So there's no real air coming in. And then there's a like a iron door that when the door is shut, then, you know, you're just behind. I don't know. I felt so claustrophobic in there. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, terrifying. I think that's a good word for it. It's like 
a horror movie in real life. Yeah. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Anyways. Did you set any parameters for when they you were writing about these women's thoughts and their stories while during their incarceration? Um, yes. Do you mean the writing itself or just in general? Just in general, really. Um, when I did my first series, which is called Life After Life in Prison, and I followed four women through their reentry, I actually wrote a little bit about their crimes mm -hmm. and gave a, some facts about them. Minimal, but something. I didn't do that. I stopped doing that as soon as I started the bedroom project. And so I do tell the viewer that they were all convicted of homicide because I want people to know that they're really serious crimes. But I don't go into the details of the crimes for a couple of reasons. One is because you never really know what the details are unless you really, really look at the record of the case. Mm -hmm. So, and even then you may not know. But also, we are meeting these women many years later, and I didn't want to stick them back in that moment of their actual crime, mm -hmm. you know, because they're trying to move beyond that. And society doesn't really let them move beyond that. And when you come up for parole, like 25 years after you've served your minimum sentence and you're eligible for parole and you go to the parole board, the first thing they ask you is what about what you did 25 years ago? And I didn't want to do that. So that's why that's that was my own parameters. Then with the women's writing itself, I asked them all the same question for the women inside prison was really easy. What do you want to say to the outside world? And then they sent me. You know, I, there was a space limit, like it had to fit within a certain mm -hmm. space. Um, and some people just wrote me exactly what they wanted to say. And some people wrote me like a couple pages. And if they wrote me a couple pages, then I would take their whatever it was that they said and edit it down to something manageable. And then I would send it back to them and say, how's this? And then they might write back or they might say, that's good. I never, ever changed a word. So all I would have done was edit out words or move something around so that it made, you know, just so that mm -hmm. it flowed a little better. The you retaining their thoughts and their words is so moving. I mean, one thing that I was really careful about too, and this is where I think the fact that I was a former lawyer is so important. And I think it's something that everybody has to keep in mind when they're doing work like the kind of work I'm doing is you don't ever want to do anything that's going to harm the person that you're photographing. And because I have that kind of knowledge, I would never, I, I just can't imagine a scenario where I would end up harming somebody. But for instance, one of the women sent me something about how she was innocent. And that was her statement. And I, I actually got to go back and talk to her and I said, you know, I know you say that you're innocent and, you know, whatever. I don't know whether you are or aren't, but you're going to the parole board in two years. And when you go to the parole board, you may have a lawyer who tells you to take responsibility because it's really hard to get out if you say you're innocent. So you don't want to have a statement out in the world that's contradicting what you're going to say when you go to the parole board. And I think most people wouldn't even know to think about that. They would just say, oh, she's innocent. And she may well, very well have been. But... It could have been to her detriment. So there's just things like that. And then it turned out that she actually told me what happened. And I was like, okay, so I understand why you think you're innocent. Factually, you're guilty. I mean, by the law, you're guilty, but I totally understand. And when I explained it to her, she was like, because it was a felony murder. She actually just went along. She was asleep in the car when something happened. Oh my gosh. And, um, but technically, that's felony mm -hmm. murder if you're along for the ride. And so, and she never really understood that. But then it also turned out that she had been offered a plea deal of two to six years. But because she didn't understand that she wasn't guilty, and she must have had, I don't know, what was the matter with her lawyer, she didn't take that two to six years, and they ended up giving her 20 years to life. Oh my so she would have served about three years in prison. She ended up serving 20 years. So I was outraged by the whole thing. And so like, I still have my lawyer side of me, even though I say don't practice. So I actually found somebody to represent her and she went to the parole board and she did get out. But, but I just think that there's so many things that 
go into, um, you know, you know, this realm that I'm working in, that you just have to be really careful. Mm -hmm. The fact that she was asleep in the mm -hmm. car, mm -hmm. I couldn't, I can't imagine that. Like, it's in my head, but like, mm -hmm. I can't imagine it at the same time being a judge and being like, yeah, you're guilty by association because you were asleep in the car. Yeah, but that's the law. I mean, that's, mm. that's a problem. That's, that's the law. And you start to, you know, there's so many stories I could tell you about. I mean, one of the women I photographed, she has a life without parole sentence, meaning she's never going to get out. But she was offered a plea deal of 17 years to life, meaning at 17 years, she would have been eligible for parole. So these are the kinds of things that I kind of want to highlight, because if before trial, you know, everybody assesses the case and says 17 years is enough, why, when you exercise your right to trial, is all of a sudden life in prison okay? Like, it should not be. I agree. And so these are the kinds of things I hope that people learn from my photography. Wow. I'm learning a lot right now. I am, yeah. too. <laughs> what is the most important detail that you want viewers to take away from your portfolio's Women with Life Sentences project? Um, just that people behind bars are people, mm -hmm. right? That. I mean, I guess that's really how I feel, is that we don't actually think of people behind bars as people, and that's why we can warehouse them in the worst conditions with the worst food. The, you know, just everything about it is so horrible. We treat people who are incarcerated just in a way that most people don't even treat their pets, you know? And so I want people to think about the humanity and then reassess, why do we do this? Should we be doing this? You know, I'm. we discussed nuance at the beginning, right? Yes. So I don't actually think I want to tell people what to think. I want people to decide for themselves. I mean, clearly I have an opinion, right? <laughs> I think we all right, do. Right, clearly I have an opinion. But I will kind of want people to say, if people are fine with warehousing people like that, then admit that and say, I'm fine with that, and I'm fine that we put people in these little teeny cells and give them the worst food in the world and no sunlight and no exercise. I'm okay with that. Or no, I'm not okay with that. And so then I have to work to change it. So throughout your entire career, mm -hmm. who has been the most influential person? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I mean, the answer truthfully is my husband. Aww. <laughs> no, no, because the thing is, is that my husband's a photographer. Oh, wow. And so that's why I started doing the photography. And if it hadn't been for him, I'm not really sure. How, like when I started the Judith Clark project, it was the women came to my house that I wanted to photograph. I used his camera. I didn't even have a, ca a camera. And I used his camera and I took the photos and they were pretty nice, you know. And I have to admit, like when I was much younger, I did you know, use a camera and I worked in a dark room and stuff, but it had just been a couple decades. And so when I started my Life After Life series and I would go out every day and be following these women and I'm taking a lot of photos and I would come home and he would sit with me and go through them all and talk to me about them. And um, so it was kind of like, I mean, he's like my teacher basically. And so, um, He's, I mean, he's a phenomenal photographer, and I just was really lucky to have somebody right there. And he actually does most of my processing for me. Wow. So. Stop. That's so <laughs> cute. It's so sweet. Oh, my gosh. So, I mean, obviously, there's other photographers who I, oh, yeah. you know, who's, I mean, one of my favorite photographers just in the documentary field is this guy called Thomas Holton who has a long-term project called The Lambs of Chinatown, where he was photographing one particular family for probably like 15 years. And his photos are really amazing, and also just like the dedication. And um, also he became very close to his subjects. And so when I was starting out, I was having a little trouble with how close I was feeling to the women I was photographing, and once I saw his work and understood that he thought it was okay. I was like, okay, it's it's okay too for me to sometimes wear a few different hats. Definitely. Mm -hmm. What is the most important lesson that you've learned during your time as a photographer? Hmm. That's, I don't know. I mean, 
It's hard for me to say that there's a particular lesson because, you know, it's like I have a lifetime of experience at this point. I mean, I really love people. I love to listen to people. I love to, like, I like to engage the way we're engaging. Mm -hmm. And you guys are doing, I think, a really good job of listening to me and then asking follow-up questions, right? And that's, I love that people let me into their lives and trust me enough, I guess, to you know, help tell their stories or something like that. So that doesn't really answer your question, but... Um, I think it's an amazing skill to have, especially when the subject matter that you're trying to portray and support, the ability to listen and hear them and portray their stories in a beautiful light that outside people who don't know the nitty gritty can appreciate and advocate for them is a big skill that a lot of photographers yeah. should strive to have mm -hmm. I mean, if I think they're that, in the field of documentation. I think you have to try really hard not to be judgmental. I think that's part of it. Like you just take people how you find them and you find, I mean, I think I can find the good in almost anybody, you know? And I, you know, it makes, it makes for a good life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it, yeah. it does. What advice can you give to people trying to enter the field of photography or people who are trying to make specific projects like your women in incarceration projects? Well, I just think you have to be really open, you know, and sort of follow the story wherever it leads you and maybe not come in with like too many preconceived ideas because you're always going to, there's always going to be, um, you know, it's kind of like a windy path. Mm -hmm. or something like that. I mean, that's funny coming from me because I had a very specific goal when I started out with what I wanted to say, and I, I'm always aware of that. But I think when you're starting out, you have to really um, delve into the subject, whatever it is, and try to learn as much as you can about it so that you can, you know, so that you can portray it in a way that, that works. And I think if you're passionate about something, you know, then, then you just can't stop yourself, you know? <laughs> that's basically the, that's basically it. Man, passion is the fuel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to get that tattooed. The passion, passion is, is the fuel. fuel. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was our last question. Okay. Um, thank you again for coming in. I know I'm looking forward to your artist talk because my thesis kind of goes hand in hand with yours. Oh, what's yours? <laughs> <laughs> so mine's kind of before the incarceration. It's true crime based. Oh, interesting. Yes, so I get to make... Crime scenes. Wow. <laughs> so I'm really excited to see yours, especially after looking at your website. I'm e looking forward more to your So I'll talk. see your work later yet, right? Yes. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> and yours? I'm not a senior, but I have some um, imagery to show to you. Yes. Um, I'm working on a self-portraiture series that oh. I've been ticking myself away at for the last three years, and I have some of my best pieces up for wow. display for you guys. Well, three years is a pretty long project. It already. is a long project. Yeah. Um, I've been studying photography for a long time, and I finally feel like I've found a project that I can es express myself. That's great. Good, good. We love that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I do. But I'm also very excited to see um, all your imagery and your talk that goes along with it. Well, you I, just heard the talk. <laughs> I know, but we're going to hear along with the imagery, which I think would just be even more powerful, um, being able to see the images you're speaking about right in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very excited to see the rest of the student body absorb what we have just absorbed from mm -hmm. you. I think all of us will be moved. Um, I hope so. In a positive light, in a light of action so that we can one day hopefully do what you've done and make a difference. I mean, after listening to your talk now, I know that my mind was slowly starting to be, hmm, I should look at this in a different light. Oh, yes. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was great talking with you guys. Yes, of course. I'm I happy do enjoy here. doing this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you to everybody listening to this podcast. Once again, I am Leona Hatch. And Riley Honey. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.